the mean is the ideal choice for understanding the center of our data. And I put ideal in quotes there because that's not any formal language, that's just my way of interpreting this. So the mean is our best choice. We want to use that whenever possible. But keep in mind in this class, anytime we have a question that says, estimate the population average, or any other similar question about averages, what we mean is determine which parameter is appropriate. Meaning, look at the mean, look at the median, which one is appropriate, and estimate or calculate that value. So in this case, since we're talking about estimates, estimate that parameter. So we'll use average to simultaneously refer to mean or median, whichever one is appropriate for the data that we're considering. So to estimate the mean, we need to verify that, some following, that the following conditions are met. In order to estimate a mean, our sample must be random and independent. And our data must come from a normally distributed population. Or we need to have a sample size that's 25 or larger. So we'll assume that condition 1 is met. And leave ourselves with verifying condition 2. So to verify condition 2, this is either one or the other of these two statements, not both. So we always want to keep in mind the easiest thing to check is sample size. Simply look at the number of data values in your list of data. If your sample size is 25 or larger, then great, you're done. There's no extra work. We just need to indicate that that's taken care of. But if our sample is less than 25, so if it's too small, then we need to use a QQ plot to assess normality. Keep in mind that when we construct those QQ plots, that comes down to taking our correlation statistic and comparing it to the critical value for the QQ plot. So whichever one is larger then has implications about the normality or the lack of normality in our population data. So when we're constructing estimates, there are just some different ideas we want to keep in mind related to the theory of confidence intervals. So for instance, every confidence interval has a confidence level. This percentage whether we choose 90, 95%, 99%, 97.6%, measures how well the method used to produce it performs. So we want to make sure we're being clear on what that confidence level actually does and doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us the probability that our estimate is correct or instead of correct, maybe say successful in capturing the true population parameter. So all the confidence level tells us about is the idea that if we could repeat this experiment over and over again, the percentage of times our confidence interval would in fact capture that population parameter. Since we're only choosing one of those at random, <clears throat> well, not choosing one at random, we're getting one of those intervals. Um, it could be that our particular confidence interval we construct does capture the population parameter or fails. And we just don't know. We also want to keep in mind <clears throat> that the larger the confidence level, the wider the confidence interval. So that means less precision in our final answer. To be more confident, or to have a higher level of confidence, 
our final resulting interval has to be wider, has to take into account more possible values. If we want to increase our confidence level without sacrificing precision, so we want to be more confident, we want to get closer to 99%, maybe 99.99%, but we don't want an interval that has to keep getting wider and wider and wider. What we want is a larger sample. So the larger our sample size, the narrower that confidence interval can be, the closer to a precise answer we can get. So if we increase our confidence level, we get a wider interval, but we can offset that by initially when we go out and collect our information when the study is initially done, collecting a larger sample. That's going to help us to get more precise results in the end.